Blackburn. I'm so excited you guys are here tonight. You know, this is actually our 13th show. That's right, our 13th show. I thought it was the 13th show last week, but then I was mistaken. So if you missed any of the first 13, you know that you can go back to watch every one of them on YouTube under my name, Christine Blackburn. Now, as you know, there's always a little excitement at the top of the show. People are settling into their seats. People are parking. Uh, everybody's checking their camera. All that good stuff's going on. Uh, but I, got, I guarantee we got a really good show for you guys tonight. I have to give you a kitten update. As you guys know, I rescued a kitten last week. Hooray! And she's adorable, and her name is Olive. And I'm going to bring her out a little later in the show. So stick around to see my new baby kitten, who is now three pounds. That's right. She gained a half a pound in a week, and the vet said I was doing very well. And for some reason, that made me feel like so good. I was like, thank you. Uh, anyway, yeah, she doesn't have feline leukemia. She doesn't have any more fleas, and she is finally hydrated. Hooray. Anyway, you guys, we have an amazing show lined up for you tonight. And then remember, in the after show, we're playing Story Smash. And Blank Apache is here again to judge the show, along with Mindy Rickles and Esther Koo. So we've got two girls uh, judging tonight, along with Blank Apache. It is just a blast. You guys cannot miss Story Smash starting right at 7 o'clock. So let's see. Our, um, oh, look, I have, a, I have a ukulele here. I was not planning on playing this, but now I just might. I just might. You'll see. You'll see. You guys, look at this. 62 people in the room. Thank you very much. Last week, we were up to 64, and so far, our highest is 89. So let's see. Maybe more people will be tuning in for Story Smash, where, as you know, it's an all-play. Everybody can play Story Smash. Spin the, one, uh, spin the wheel of stories and tell a true one-minute story. This, you see, this is what happens. Messages are coming in. A lot of stuff is going on. Uh, but we are going to have a great time, and we're going to get started right away, you guys. This first guy who's going to come up and tell a true 10-minute story, he is from my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he and I have known each other since I did my first stand-up gig at the Funny Bone in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we're from. And that was in 1992. That's when I met him, 1992. He, was, uh, he used to be the host of that very, very popular game show called Street Smarts. You guys remember. And he's a headlining comedian, not only across the country, but here at the Laugh Factory, which is, in fact, a pretty, a pretty big deal. All right, you guys, wherever you are in the country, please put your hands together for my friend, Frank Nicotero. Hey, Frank. So I'm going to take you guys back to 1980. It's 1980, and uh, I was born in Pittsburgh. We lived in L.A. for a few years in the 70s. My dad was out here as a DJ and an actor. But in 1980, uh, we moved back to Pittsburgh. And for about six months, when we first moved back, we lived in the house next door to my grandmother. So uh, that was interesting. And uh, it was fantastic having a grandmother right next door. So one night, in the middle of the night, uh, I hear a phone ring, because uh, we had wall-mounted phones. It was a dial phone. And... Uh, it's my grandmother calling for my dad to run over to the house. There's an emergency. So we run over to my grandmother's house again, right next door. And there was a bat in her bedroom. Okay. Like a bat. And I'm, I'm 11 years old and I'm groggy. Cause it's like, it was after midnight. I remember that. And I remember Johnny Carson was on the TV. So anyway, we run over to my grandmother's house and there's a bat hanging in my grandmother's bedroom. She's screaming. She's horrified. She's under the sheets. She called us on the phone from under the sheets. So my dad wants to get rid of the bat, opens the window uh, further that the, the bat's hanging on, and uh, he gets a broom from the kitchen. And my dad takes a broom and hits the bat, and the bat starts flying around the room. I'm 11, I'm screaming like a little girl. My dad finally hits the bat and gets it out the window, slams the window shut, and he's a hero, right? So I remember going to school the next day, very tired, but telling everybody how my dad, you know, saved my grandmother and got rid of this bat. So it was a big deal. It was the, the 1980 story of the bat. So we move to the North Hill section of Pittsburgh, about a half hour away from my grandmother. And it's maybe six months later, uh, maybe six months later. And uh, apparently in our new house, we now have a bat. 
Now this is how it goes down. Now, again, it was on a school night. My sister Gina was sleeping, who's four years older than me. So she was about 15, I'm like 11. And my dad uh, wakes us up. And it was very, it was very scary because just the hall light was on. He opens both of our doors and he's like, all right, kids. And this is what no parent has ever said to any other kid. My dad says, kids, I'm going to fire my gun in the house. Okay, now, right now, if this happened nowadays, you can hear children's services just coming and taking us away. And we're wiping the sleep out of our eyes. We're like, what are you talking? What do you mean you're going to fire your gun in the house? Now, my dad, uh, he loved Westerns, and he had a revolver. Oh, my dad grew up watching 19, you know, 40s and 50s Westerns and fancied himself a cowboy from Pittsburgh, and he had a revolver. And he kept it with a bunch of his cowboy movies that he had on VHS and maybe even Betamax in 1980. It might have been just beta, but he had a collection of them. So uh, I remember him going to get the gun, and uh, he grabs the kids and he goes, all right, come down here. We're like, Dad, why are you going to fire the gun in the house on a school night? On a school night, really doesn't matter. So my dad goes to open the door that leads down the steps to the basement. Now, for those of you on the West Coast, a basement is a level underneath the house. That's awesome. I live in California now. I miss a basement. I would kill to have a basement to put all this stupid sports memorabilia in there and a bar and a big screen TV and watch sports. It would be amazing. My girlfriend would never have to see me. But I don't have a basement. But we had a basement. So my dad cracks open the door leading down the steps to the basement and points up to the very high ceiling above the steps. And there's the bat. There's a bat in the corner, right? He goes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot the bat with my gun. Now, I kind of bring up to him. I'm like, but, you know, six months ago when there was a bat at grandma's house, you were a hero. You got the broom. You hit it. Went out the window. I bragged about it the next day at school. What, that, what, what do you mean you're going to shoot your gun, which seems highly illegal? Probably not even registered. It was 1980. So I said, when I get a broom, he goes, well, I, I, the broom can't reach. And I'm like, oh, well, he brings up a good point. The broom probably wouldn't reach. But maybe you get a towel, a tennis ball, something. I don't know. Something better than a gun. So now my dad, who enjoyed marijuana. Now, I'm not saying my dad was stoned that night, but I'm imagining he is. And maybe he's envisioning that bat to be the size of Mothra. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know why. So he tells his kids, he's like, all right, stand back. First of all, if you're going to fire a gun in the house, maybe tell the kids to go back to their bedrooms. I don't know. By the way, my mom, who's watching this right now in Pittsburgh, is probably horrified at this story. Uh, I'm sure she tried to talk him out of this, but he was on a mission. It was uh, Cowboy Sam wanted to shoot the bat. So uh, he, he, gets, he, he goes into cowboy mode immediately. He's cowboy. So... He tells his kids to stand back. So he opens the door to the basement, right? And he gets down in a crouch, <laughs> fires the gun and shuts the door. All right? Now he opens it, <laughs> shuts the door again. So he fires three shots at the bat, at the top of the high ceiling above the basement steps. Now he shuts the door and we wait for a noise. I don't know. I'm assuming my dad's a pretty good shot. Uh, <laughs> Gun smoke is, <laughs> fills the den that the, the door was by. So literally, I mean, it's this revolver. I mean, my dad should have put a cowboy hat on. That actually would have been amazing had he put a cowboy hat on. Now, I'm immediately awake. Now, remember, it was a school night, and I remember specifically having a giant test the next day that I studied late for, but now I know I'm going to fail this test. I'm rattled. My dad just fired a gun in the house. And by the way, we had two neighbors. We had neighbors on either side. 1980, no one thought to call the cops. I don't know why. Nowadays, if a firecracker goes off, ABC News is outside. So we're now, we're now letting the gun smoke die down, which smelled my pajamas. I had Superman pajamas on, I remember, now filled with gun smoke. So we're like, okay, we got to see if the bat's dead. So we open up the door, and we see the bat still kind of like up against the wall, right? But we see stuff flying around and we're like, oh my God, my dad is such a good shot. 
He did three shots, probably hit him every time. Bat guts are flying around. The bat is pinned to the wall by the slug my dad has put into this bat. So we open the door. Now, by the way, no one had gotten a flashlight to make sure it was a bat, right? But now I go, why don't we get the Radio Shack flashlight that we get for free when you cut out that coupon in the Sunday paper once a year? So I go get the flashlight, which has four to eight D batteries. That's how flashlights work back then. So we open the door. Now we fully expect to now just see the bat fall down or blood trickling down. So we open the door. My dad still has the gun drawn with the kids and the mom all looking in. So if you shot that from the bottom of the steps, you'd see four heads looking in to see the dead bat. We don't see anything, so I get the flashlight and I shine the flashlight and boom, there it was. There were two holes and another hole in what my dad thought was a bat, but was actually a strip this long of Owens Corning attic insulation that had fallen through one of the attic <laughs> levers and was a piece of insulation. So that is what my dad thought was a bat. Shot three times with a gun, and now it's just flowing around there. So what we thought was a bat particles flying through the air is actually probably, I don't know, fiberglass or asbestos. So my dad didn't shoot a bat. He shot a piece of Owens Corning insulation, and boy, did I have a story for everybody at lunch the next day. That's my story. And I figured a bad story was appropriate for COVID times. <laughs> All right. That was an amazing story, you guys. Frank Nicotero. Okay, a couple of questions. First of yes. all, um, how heavy was that flashlight when you put all those oh, batteries oh, in? Oh, these were, these were these, seriously, if, if anyone remembers, it was in Pittsburgh. My cousins don't remember. You got a free flashlight once a year from Radio Shack. It was a long gray, big plastic thing and had a red lid that you tie on. Oh, and it yeah. was 4D batteries. It was huge. Like it was just as big as me. And I remember holding it like a wiffle ball bat and shine it up. And we see it's a piece of insulation that my dad thought he shot. Again, he might've been under the influence. Okay. And the other thing I want to ask you is Frank, I'm sorry, why do you need a basement for what? Uh, it would be great for like sports memorabilia, like my what? terrible <laughs> towel and all my stuff. Because it seems to me you got that all worked out. Okay, well, this, yeah, well, I mean, but it would, like, in Pittsburgh, you know how nice it is in the winter, you get a fire going down there? Yeah. But, yeah, I do kind of have a man cave here with my Pittsburgh stuff. You're right. <laughs> you but, really do. You have a man but cave. But basements, you know basements. That's where a lot of... But I always remember basements being very scary. Like, I didn't want to go down to the basement. And when I was a kid, for some reason, and my sisters who are watching can back me up, <laughs> uh, we kept the pencil sharpener in the basement. <laughs> and <laughs> It was attached to the door and then you had to go, you know, like you had to, you know, ring it or, or whatever, oh, yeah. dial it or whatever. And then, and when I would be coming up the steps from getting my pencil sharpened, I would fucking fly like the wind because you don't know what's behind you. Well, ours was scary, but right when we moved in, we, we just put up some of that, the 1980s wood paneling, right. you know, so it had the wood paneling and it had a couple chairs. So it wasn't horribly scary. And our dog was down there a lot, but I know I, my, my grandmother's basement was horrifying. The one before. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh yeah. My grandmother's basement. My, yeah. She did, wasn't a basement, but her attic thing. There are so many, isn't that funny when you think about those homes, Frank, I don't know if it's oh, just Pittsburgh or, or what, but. Well, my uncle still lives in that house on McClure Avenue on the North side, wow. which my family's lived in since the like 19 better part since like 1935, I think. Is it a row house? Um, no, it's, it's a little separate from the row, but it literally was right down the street from St. John's hospital. All the houses are very similar. It's not a row house, but, but it's right on the corner there and he's still there, man. And it's, it's a trip to go in there. Cause I remember going in there in 1980, 40 years well, ago. Well, listen, um, next storyteller is coming up, but then after her, I'm going to be telling a story, Frank, I hope you'll listen because okay. it's about the Northway mall. Oh shit. I worked at the Northway mall at national record Mart, And you don't uh, think I don't know that you think I don't know that I know you worked at the North, the North way mall oh, shit. and i'm going to be talking about it in about five no 10 minutes 10 minutes okay. 10 minutes all right gotcha. stick around well thank all you for having me christine always a pleasure this is always a blast thanks frank all Love right it. you guys this next talent she's a comedian and a television personality and an actress she was a cast member on the mtv shows girl wild and wild no girl code girl code and wild and out 
And she was also on season six of Last Comic Standing. She's also been on the Joe Rogan podcast and she plays clubs all over the place. She's just amazing. Please put your hands together for my friend, Esther Koo. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, thank you, Frank, for that bet story. I love it. I'm not Chinese. Don't blame me for coronavirus. And um, thanks for those private details about McClure Avenue. I feel like I could steal your identity now, Frank Nicotero. <laughs> All right, my story, I was a little older. Um, I was 19 years old and I was a virgin in college and I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. And before there was Taco Tuesdays, we had Taco Fridays. So um, we just, we were a state school. So we didn't know to line up the letters and alliterate our our meal days. So I lived in the dorms and there was every Friday we took the bus up to ISR, which is a dorm on the north side. And our friends and I, we went and ate tacos and they had like a Mexican themed uh, dorm uh, cafeteria all set up. So there were like pinatas hanging from the ceiling. There was a taco bar and it was just like a fun place to go on Friday nights. So I always, you know, because when you're a virgin, you have all these like thoughts and you kind of think too much. And I was a virgin. So I always felt like I, I suffered from, uh, or I benefited from yellow privilege because no one ever questioned anything I did. Even if I was a bad kid, even if I uh, cheated, or even if I, you know, did something bad, like the white kid would always get in trouble more than I would actually. So I felt like, you know what, this is not fair. If I'm, if I'm like not getting in trouble for stuff, imagine people of other races who are getting in trouble who didn't do anything. So I wanted to do a social experiment at the Taco Fridays. And I told my friends, I said, listen, I bet you I can grab a pinata that's hanging from the ceiling and walk out with it past the guy who like swipes our meal cards and he'll just think that I'm going to refill it with candy and not think that I'm like taking a pinata because people are like reverse racist against Asians. So they were like, do it, do it. So I just calmly walk up to one of the pinatas and there's like 20 pinatas hanging from the ceiling and I just lift it up it was hanging by a paper clip and i lift it up and i take it down i don't the key to doing something and not and getting away with it is you can't like turn around and be like look at me i did it you gotta just like do it right so i grab the pinata i'm carrying this like humongous pinata and i just calmly walk out the front door of the cafeteria and the guy uh, just as i suspected the guy swiping the meal cards you know he's a student um, he didn't stop me. He just let me walk out. So every Friday we took the bus up to ISR and we would go and I would take a pinata and I would take the pinata home to my dorm on the bus. And my friends were like, Oh my God, I can't believe you got another pinata. So the second week, the third week, fourth week, I just kept taking pinatas and I'm like, man, you guys, everybody's so racist. They don't even stop me and say, what are you doing with that pinata? They just let me walk out with the pinatas. So I said, see, I told you I'm right. Um, people always think that Asians are just, you know, not up to anything bad. Well, that was before coronavirus. So then um, I had nine pinatas in my dorm room. And these dorm rooms, I went to a state school. It's like, you know, they're tiny. So my whole room was just filled with pinatas. And it was colorful, it was festive. I grew up with Mexicans in Chicago, it was awesome. And the, the 10th week uh, I went and one of my guy friends was like, you know what, I'm gonna take a pinata this time with you. And he thought it was like, gonna be a good plan. And, and I, <laughs> looking back now, I'm like, no, I should have said no, I'm the pinata thief, you don't get to copy me but he insisted and he's like, he was like six foot something, you know, he's like a big, huge guy. And so I take a pinata, then he takes a pinata and we walk out the cafeteria. And this time the guy working at the, uh, the, the front desk, he had had it. And like the ceiling kind of looked empty. A lot of the pinatas were gone by now. 
and he started chasing us outside of the cafeteria, out the door, and we're running down Green Street, which is like the big street uh, in Champaign-Urbana, and we're, he's chasing us, and he's like a bigger guy, and he's chasing us, and we're, we're carrying these two pinatas just running down the street. People are like honking their horns at us, like what is going on? And finally, we lost him. And thank God he just kind of like gave up and went back to work. And meanwhile, uh, me and my, my male friend, we were like running through the quad and we finally lost him and we like rested underneath a tree and uh, he probably wanted to make out or something. And eventually he became my boyfriend, but, um, but we got away with it. But like he caught us, you know what I mean? So I was like, I told you, like I get away with more than you do. Um, just based on my demographic. So cut to, uh, now I had 10 pinatas in my dorm room. And that summer, I worked for the university as an orientation student leader. And I gave like tours to the incoming freshmen and their parents uh, that summer. And that summer, we all the uh, orientation leaders lived in that dorm where the Mexican Friday night dinner was. So we're all living there for the summer. And the guy who had chased us down the street a few months earlier was working in the cafeteria that summer too. And I was there with my bright orange orientation leader uniform on and my khaki pants. And I was now an employee of the university. So he saw me and I saw him and he made a beeline to my boss of orientation student services and he told her that I'm the pinata thief and was like, you know, she, what the hell? She's working for the university, freaking fire her. I don't know what he said, but my, uh, my boss called me into the office and she was about to fire me until my, my uh, junior boss like stood up for me and was like, ah, don't, don't fire her for that. It's fine. Like, whatever. It's just funny. Like you steal pinatas. Uh, there wasn't even any candy in them. So luckily, I didn't get fired from my job, but I did uh, have to go see the dean at the dean's office um, on the south side of campus. So they had like, you know, in their schedule, pinata thief, two o'clock appointment. So I go down there, I go, you know, kind of a little nervous, but also it's kind of funny, right? Like who gets in trouble for stealing pinatas? So I go to the office and I go up to the receptionist and I say, hi, I'm here for my two o'clock appointment. And she's like, your name? I'm like, Esther Koo. And they're like, and this woman looks at me and she goes, you're the pinata thief? And I'm like, see what I mean? Everybody's so racist. Like, yes, I just did it to prove that like you shouldn't trust Asians. So I had to go in there and have a meeting with the dean. And the dean was kind of like laughing and he looked at the piece of paper and I had to sign a piece of paper saying that I won't, won't steal university property anymore. And I'm, I was placed on university reprimand uh, and I could have been kicked out if I stole something else. Well, I thought it would be funny to steal. <laughs> so he had to go make a copy after I signed this form uh, that said, um, I won't steal anything else ever again from the university. And then, so he went to make a copy and while he went to make a copy, I thought it'd be funny if I stole his nameplate and uh, mailed it back. But <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that, but um, it was just a fun, a funny story. And I had to return all the pinatas to Illinois student residence dorm uh, on the north side of campus. <laughs> so that's my pinata thief story. and. Uh, that's how that's how we got here, and I I was on university reprimand, but now I I never got kicked out. It would have been better if I got kicked out. Actually, I could have started my stand up career earlier. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You're cool. I had no idea you were a pinata thief. <laughs> this is so risque. I just had no idea. That's a laugh. Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to prove a point, and I didn't, I didn't think I would really get away with it every single time. I'm like, certainly I'll get caught at some point, 
Wow. Well, you're really going to like my story because it's in that same vein. So I'm excited you're, you're here. And you guys remember, uh, all these guys, check out their, their, uh, everybody on the show tonight. Please go over to their websites and their Twitter pages and all that good stuff and follow them. That's always so helpful to all of us. Uh, anyway, I also want to remind you guys we're playing Story Smash in the after game. It's an all play. Everybody can spin the wheel and tell a true one minute story. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, it is gets funnier and funnier. And I'm really, really hoping you stick around because you're going to love it as well. I will. So what, what was that, Esther? I said I will. You will. Good. I have a special friend in the audience tonight and I grew up with her. We grew up together completely from the ages of four till 17. So as elementary school, middle school and high school. And she was with me uh, in this story I'm about to tell. In Pittsburgh, where I grew up in the, in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, really it was kind of rural, there was only one shopping mall, and it was a big deal. It was called the Northway Mall, and it was just so exciting. They had a giant parrot cage in the middle of the mall, so birds are like flying around. There was a little train at Christmas time that you could ride and it would take you around to sit on Santa's lap and then they'd take your picture. And at Easter time, that same train, which would now be decorated with bunnies and pastel colors, it would take you on a magical ride to have your picture taken with a giant rabbit. It all happened at the Northway Mall. And by the way, there were uh, the department store at the time in Pittsburgh. It was called Joseph Horns. And there was also a giant Woolworths. You guys remember the, the five and dime. And then there was the National Record Mart. And that's where Frank Nicotero used to work. And he used to steal CDs. I know that for a fact. <laughs> you can come on and verify. It also had an orange Julius in the mall. And then there was a Spencer's Gifts. Do you guys remember Spencer's? They had like black light posters. And then they sold like these really, you know, these games that were kind of risque. And they would be called things like Blackout and, and, and Truth or Dare. They sold sometimes earrings that were just single. As if somebody was wearing either mismatched earrings or, God forbid, just one earring. I mean, it was crazy at the Spencer's Gifts. They even sold something called a pecker pop, which was a popsicle shaped like a pecker. That's right. I got my entire sex education at Spencer's Gifts. I don't know about you guys. So one afternoon, uh, I think it was my father, took me and my friend Kimmy Eddie, who's here tonight, and our friend jo Joan Kelly to the mall. So we could walk around for like, you know, three hours or whatever. And this was always a lot of fun. We'd go in the National Record Mart and look at Kiss albums. And then we'd, uh, we'd go look at the parrots, of course. We'd flip through the black light posters at Spencer's. It was always just such a fun thing to be out, of, out on our own and nobody was around. So I'm 12 years old. Did I mention that? I'm 12 years old. And one of our favorite places to go was Woolworths, the five and dime. The Woolworths was actually two stories. And on the, the, the top story where you walked in, they had a soda fountain that had balloons all around the top of the soda fountain. And you could buy one of those balloons, pop it, and whatever price was inside, that's what you paid for your banana split. So it was super fun. And there was an escalator. There was an escalator in the Woolworths. So... This day, I'm with my friends, Kimberly and, and, uh, and Joan Kelly, and we decided to go down to the pet department. Now, we take the big escalator all the way down to the bottom floor of the Woolworths, and we go over to see the pets. Now, they're not really, you know, it's not dogs and cats. It's not like that. It's more just like gerbils, hamsters, goldfish, maybe a lizard or a salamander, maybe a snake now and then. But as we're walking through the pets, uh, the pet department and looking at the different aquariums and the different tanks, I had this great idea. And I say to Kimberly and Joan, you guys, I got a great idea. How about if we steal a hamster? I put it in my pocket. And then tomorrow we'll put it in Nanine Huygens' locker at school. And then when she opens her locker, she'll be like, what? 
out and she'll think it's a, she'll think it's a mouse and she'll freak out. It'll be so funny. You guys, you guys, look out. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. And then I reach my hand into the hamster cage. And in fact, I pull up a hamster who immediately pees on my hand. And the, uh, the bedding that he's laying in, those little wood chips are clinging to his little paws. And I shove him quickly into my members only blue windbreaker, which was my favorite windbreaker. It had a yellow and white stripe down the sleeve. I swear to God, I'd wear it today. So now I have the hamster and I say, let's go, let's go, let's go. And we take off out of Woolworths, probably running, but at least trotting very quickly. And we no sooner got halfway up the ramp in the mall than we heard a woman who worked at the store run out in a red apron and she screamed, thieves, thieves, those girls are thieves. That one has a hamster in her pocket. So now we're busted. So I'm like, let's go, you know, run. And then Kimmy has the great idea that we should run into the Hammond organ store. You know, the Hammond organ store where no teenager in the history of the world has ever gone in their lives, let alone anybody else, really. You know, where you play the different sounds on the organs. And so now we're trapped in the back of the Hammond organ store. And in comes the lady in the red apron, and the mall cop. We're trapped, and all I can hear is the beat of a bossa nova. And the cop says, let me see what's in your pocket. And I slowly pull out the hamster, who has more urine in him than I knew a hamster could have in him. Peed all over my hands. There's, there's you know, the little, the little bedding, and the wood chips are falling off my hands. And I say, here, just take it. And we'll pay for it, too. The, oh, no, 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 girls. No, no. You're coming with me. So now we have to follow this store manager into the Woolworths and all the way back up the escalator. And he takes us to the soda fountain, and I don't think we'll be popping any balloons. He sits us down, and he has each of us write our phone numbers on a piece of paper, and he is going to call our parents. He is mad, and he says, girls? The thing is, first it's hamsters, and tomorrow it's cars. And I rolled my 12-year-old eyes and said, I doubt that. I doubt that very much. Give me your number first, Missy. And he took my number, and he called my dad. Well, my dad insisted on picking all three of us up. So we sat there at the Woolworths counter waiting for my father. And then my father took me and Kimmy Eddie and Joan Kelly into his car. We dropped off Joan first, then we dropped off Kimberly. And then my father and I sat in the car and I knew I was gonna be in some trouble. But we drove back home and when we got in the house, my mother was strewn out on our green velour couch with a, uh, like, a, like, a like a headache band on her head, like some ice on her head and she was saying, I knew this was going to happen to one of my children. Six children, and one went bad. And I remember rolling my 12-year-old eyes and thinking, I doubt that very much. And then my father sat down, and he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, Christine, you tell me the truth. What happened? And I looked at my dad. I sat there, and I calmly said, it was all Joan Kelly's idea. She did it, and I blamed someone else. Then my mother said, I, my mother said, go to your room, which I didn't really have a bedroom, so I just kind of went in another room, and my mother said, you're going to confession on Saturday. Usually, we only had to go to confession every six weeks, but now I had to get another confession in, where between me and the priest, I said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I lied, I swore, I disobeyed, and I stole a hamster from Woolworths. And guess what, guys? I never stole anything again. Thank you. Yay! Okay, <laughs> there it is. That is, uh, that is what happened when I stole a hamster. But the good news is, like I said, I never stole again. So something stuck, right? Something stuck. 
All right, you guys, this next guy coming on the stage, I love this guy. He's a comedian with a unique brand of humor. He draws from his Midwestern Chicago roots and his Marine Corps experience. He's entertained audiences all over the country and in comedy clubs like the Hollywood Improv, the Orlando, or no, the Ontario Improv, the Greensboro Comedy Zone, dive bars, bowling alleys, elevators, Al-Anon meetings. <laughs> Please put your hands together for my friend, Jacob Rosales. Oh. That I like that the hamster, hamster thievery. We got to bring that back. That is just reminding me of back in my glory days in the '80s, going to the mall, Spencer's. That was nice. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, it got some yarns to weave about back when I was in Uncle Sam's Marine Corps, the United States Marine Corps. It was, it was fun. It was, it, it was. I served from 2002 until 2006. And it was just, I, you know, I mean, I, I don't know why, like I, I, I lived in Michigan and I didn't, I didn't join for any kind of like patriotic du duty or call, you know, call the bugle horn. I just, I, I, I needed to escape that economic cesspool of Michigan. And so I was like, yeah, sure. I could join the Marine Corps. There's, uh, there's probably going to be a war going on under, you know, false pretenses for WMDs, but this this could be an interesting career move. Let's do that. Yeah, I was a, I was an artillery man, field artillery cannoneer. It got real. I mean, I got some really good transferable skills to the civilian world. It was you know, I mean, like pulling string, go boom, picking a big round and shooting it out of a cannon. It was a lot like working in the office, you know, developing VBA and macros in Microsoft Word and Excel. Oh, thank you for your. Hey, someone said thank you for your service. I take my thanks in beer. <laughs> but anyways, I, I, get, I get into what's called the fleet. I get done with all my basic training and all that jazz. And it was, it was interesting. I remember our master gunnery sergeant, first day, he gets all the new guys, all of us fucking new guys. And he's, he's telling us what unit we're going to go to. And then at the end, I remember this like it was yesterday. He says, he says, I need two volunteers for you devil dogs. Volunteer to go to Fox Battery. They're going to go to Okinawa, Japan. 31st new. You're going to sail around in a naval ship. I need two volunteers. Put your dick skinners up in the air. So for a layperson, dick skinner is marine jargon for your hand. I know it's kind of very uh, eloquent terminology we used. So he says this, and the very first thing, that comes to my head, my dumb 22 year old head is, dude, Okinawa, that's where Mr. Miyagi's from in the Karate Kid. And so I, yeah, I put my hand in the air. I'm like, why the hell not? This could be interesting. So he says, you're going Rosales. I get to go to Okinawa. It was, it was interesting. It was, it was. Nightlife was, uh, Nightlife was pretty, uh, I, I guess, for lack of better terms, it <laughs> wax off, wax off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lack of better terms, the nightlife in o Okinawa, it was pretty X-rated. They had this thing called the banana show. I won't go into detail, but I've never seen Kegel power that strong in a woman before. It was, it was wonderful. Anyways, after about like two months there, I got a little bored with the nightlife, going out and getting hammered every, uh, oh, no, 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 later on, later on. Okay, deta you, okay, details, okay. So you go to this really gross, dingy bar right outside the Air Force Base. We're talking like the bathrooms were just like a hole in the ground, and you get there, and it's dark, and it stinks like cigarettes, and it's just, it's not, it's, it, it, it's weird, it's weird. And you get there, and this old seven-year-old Okinawan woman comes out and she's wearing a kimono and she's got a plastic grocery bag filled with bananas. And I'll let you think about what she does with those bananas. And I was amazed at what she did with the roll of quarters. Blew my mind. Like I said, very powerful kegels. Yeah. So anyways, after a while, just the nightlife, I got a little bored of it. And, and I was like, I can't go out every weekend. Well, what it was, I lost, I lost my military ID. So I kind of like couldn't, couldn't really get off base without my military ID. So I was like, okay, I got to do something on the weekend. I'll go to the base library. Maybe I can find some interesting books or some videos or something. So I'm walking around. I'm at the library. 
and I find, I don't know how I found this. And this is a profound moment for me because this here, this is the moment where I got turned on to liberal and progressive politics and ideologies. Yeah, in the Marine Corps, the base library in Okinawa, Japan. It just, it just happened. It was one of those things where it just happened. It was, it was weird. I found the VHS tape to the documentary on Noam Chomsky manufacturing consent. I probably could have found the book there as well, but you know, I was a Marine and I wasn't too keen on reading, but I watched that film and I, it's just something about it, you know, being all critical about US foreign policy and whatnot. It was, it was something. And that, that, that's been ever since, ever since that film, I've always kind of like had more of a liberal lean with stuff. But I think that to me, the weird thing is, is like, I could go to that base library and I could find all the subversive work that was critical of like U.S. foreign policy by Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and Chalmers Johnson and Gore Vidal right in the base library. And that was perfectly fine. But if I wanted to open mouth kiss another man, that was a big old fucking no-no. Ain't that something? Yeah. And I think, I think actually serving during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that was one of the biggest sacrifices that I had in my time in the Marine Corps. I missed out on a lot of really good sexual opportunities. Yeah. No, really. I mean, like group sex, it would get weird. I mean, you're like in an orgy and you're staring in your corporal's eyes for like 45 minutes straight. And the dude just, he just gets all, he gets all weird about it. You're like, come on, what, what, what's the big deal? I, well, I, you know, I mean, from the warrior's perspective, if you're on, you know, the battlefield, friendly fire is devastating. I get that. But if you're at a swinger party, I mean, friendly fire is just collateral damage. It gets in your eyes and it stings for like five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Let, oh, yeah. Sorry. So, so I, I kind of, I digress, but let's get back to Chomsky because this was fascinating. So I discovered Chomsky. First, it's the video. And then I start reading his books. You know, all this stuff being critical of U.S. foreign policy, talking about blowback, being critical of the global war on terror. And I'm just like, wow, this is fascinating. And I decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to send old, old Noam Chomsky, I'm going to give him an email. Let's say hi to Noam. Let's see how he's doing. And so I sent him an email, and by God, he answered back. I wasn't sure, because at this time, he was probably like 75. I didn't know how, how computer literate he was. But he sent back. I was pen pals with Noam Chomsky in the Marine Corps. I thought that was just, I thought that was the bee's knees. And then I started, I started emailing my senators. That was fun until, and, and, until my officers found out. And then they're like, why are you emailing your senators? And I'm like, I'm just curious about legislation, about fast food, <laughs> about, about, about fast food restrictions. And they just look at me. They thought I was the dumbest piece of shit. It was, it was fantastic. Oh, I had so much fun. We would PT. I remember we would PT. We would, we would go out and we would run. And, and we had these, these really, it was disgusting because this, this was 2004. And we had these short, short, green, nut hugger, nylon, green shorts that we would wear with green t-shirts. It was the most disgusting thing. Every time we ran, I just wanted to sing cadence to the Nair song. Who wears short shorts? We wear short shorts every day. We nair our shorts the Marine Corps way. It was very weird. But I remember I was like, I was on this whole liberal kick. And so I was like, I'm gonna make a custom made t-shirt it's awesome. I made a custom made t-shirt and it said war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And it was the best time. And that's how I discovered liberal and progressive politics and ideologies. Thank you all. That's my story. Have a good night. Wow. All right. Jacob Rosales. I love having smart friends. Don't you guys? I love, I love meeting new people and, um, and learning from them. I would say I'd meet about one person, um, a year here in LA. And that doesn't sound like that many, like only one. I mean, I meet more people, but I mean, I could befriend, but I've been here 23 years and I have 23 really good friends. So it's actually quite good. Anyway, thank you, J Jacob. You are my friend of 2019. <laughs> Come on down. Thanks, Jacob. All right, you guys, one more talent coming up and then we're going to start our story smash, the storytelling game show. All right. This girl is fantastic. She has been on Story Worthy many times because she always has a good story. And she's also played Story Smash before at the Improv. And tonight she's going to be one of the judges. 
She is a, a regular performer here at the Laugh Factory in Los Angeles, and she's whip smart and definitely takes after her father, who was the late great Don Rickles. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Mindy Rickles. Yay! Okay, this is very, this is very exciting. This is the most excitement I've had since when I woke up this morning and the dog kind of took a piss on my face. Um, so anyway, the story I'm going to tell um, happened, I'm going to say, you know, before the COVID virus, because now um, I, you know, I make masks out of different things I've lying around the house, you know, like skin of King Tut. I try to do things that are very unique with the mask or some kind of sheep's fleece, whatever I can find to, you know, make the mask that's very unusual. So um, before all of that, obviously, um, I, my son, my older son was in school and he was a senior in high school. And um, I'm someone that I always have some kind of an illness. Um, if I don't have an illness, I make up an illness. I'm just, I've always been, I feel a sickly person, and that's part of my identity. But this time, I actually had a real illness. Um, I, out of the blue, one day I woke up and it was like, you know, my legs and my feet felt completely numb. So, you know, of course, that was relaxing for me. So I thought, you know, I'm going to become like a paraplegic, which... You know, I went to the very extreme, you know, I needed sort of a, a wheelchair that was encrusted with diamonds or something that I could feel comfortable in because I'm someone if I have to wear my glasses, even though I wear contacts, that's devastating to me. So I, um, I couldn't feel my legs and I went to a bunch of doctors. And each doctor once said, you know, it was... It could be a brain tumor, it could be a virus, it could be, you know, wearing too much jewelry, um, it could be anything. So no one could really diagnose it, but I had to continue, you know, to live my life this way, right? So anyway, um, as I walked around every day with my legs completely numb, I realized something very quickly, which was not only you know, your legs are connected to your whole body and the next, you know, connecting area would be your ass. And so I realized very quickly that my ass was numb. Now my ass is, you know, there's not much there, it's very flat, um, but somehow it was completely numb. And I found that I lost, sickening, but I, I lost some control of my bowel. So I would find that in the middle of the night, I would wake up in horror because, you know, like I'd been eating, you know, a bunch of spicy Mexican food for a month. I had the runs and I had to rush to the bathroom. So now this became a problem, okay? Because I, you know, I'm not yet in an assisted living facility. So I wanted to kind of live my life without having a problem. And as devastating as this was, I decided to go to, you know, the store and get a box of adult diapers, just, you know, on a temporary basis, because I was assuming that at some point this was going to go away. So, you know, I got the diapers, um, I put, put them on, again, it was very upsetting. The only good, you know, I have a very flat ass, so suddenly with the diaper, a little bit of a Nicki Minaj ass, but other than that, it was just very depressing and very upsetting. So I, um, I started, you know, going around, you know, wearing the diaper. And during this time, um, and you know, now also during the day, I usually wear like workout clothes, um, like biking shorts, and, you know, some kind of a workout top with the, uh, you know, the sports bra, whatever. Now, the irony of that is that I don't work out. And, but I feel like in LA, it's a great outfit to wear. You know, some people might think I'm a trainer, 
but then they would be like, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you know, why does this trainer back? But anyway, so I would wear that. So I went to school to pick up my son and I hadn't, um, you know, it, it's a, a carpool lane. And there was a dad at the school that had been like a very famous model and he was very gorgeous. And whenever I used to see him around school, you know, it was like I was back in high school and I would, you know, be very flustered, you know, I'd walk into a wall. Anyway, um, he hadn't seen me, I hadn't seen him in a while and I had lost, you know, a certain amount of weight. And I was in the carpool line and I was, you know, I, that day I had no makeup on. I was wearing like a big floppy hat and dark glasses. You know, I was like Manson girl number five. And I, you know, it was very covered up. And she comes to the car window, which she never did that before. And meantime, my feet, my legs are numb. And he's like, hi, oh my God, look at you. You've lost so much weight. You look fabulous. You look like this. Okay, at this point, I start to get nervous. I'm sweating. And the legs are like numbing up even more. And I'm like, Jesus, I hope I don't crap my pants while he's standing here because, you know, I'm getting so flustered. And um, he, he's in the car window. And I realize that I have a huge purse there with one of these big adult diapers inside because, you know, I thought I needed to have extra. And I'm like, God forbid, you know, he sees the diapers which are right on the top of the purse. So, you know, I'm mortified and he's saying, oh, you look so great, blah, blah, blah. And I think, you know, nothing, there's not going to be a problem with this. And then all of a sudden, this guy, he's also very charming and, you know, like a, like a Pierce Brosnan, Hugh Grant kind of thing. Suddenly he thinks it's funny. He grabs my huge purse from the window and starts running across the parking lot as the kids, and my son are coming out of class. And it's like my worst nightmare, you know, is before my eyes. It's like I'm on Titanic or it's World War II. And, and I don't even like World War II movies. They're boring to me. But anyway, it's a nightmare. And I think, and during this, I'm going to crap myself. And he runs across and sure enough, the diaper falls out of the, the bag. Big old lady diaper. And I'm supposed to be the sexy, fabulous girl that I'm like 20. And my son comes out and all of his friends and they all see the diaper on the ground. And I don't know what to say. And I yell out, that's my husband. And that was it. So basically, I put my husband in a very bad position as somebody that probably didn't have many more years to live and had a very high insurance policy and I was going to become a very wealthy woman shortly. And that's my story. Thank you. <laughs> that's a perfect story, Mindy. That Thank is you. so humiliating. Did so your humiliating. child so keep going more, to school? We don't have time. What? Did your child keep going to school with that other kid and then that father? Like, did you have to see him? Oh, yeah. Again? They're still best friends. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't know if they blocked it out. We don't discuss it. It's, you know, it's so humiliating. Whenever I see him, you know, I dodge into a folding chair. It's just, it's still to this day, you know, he doesn't mention it, but it's embarrassing. I can't believe that nobody told you that that could happen in terms of, you know, like, if you get to right. the point, you know, somebody should have warned you. Right. Nobody <laughs> did. They don't want to talk about the dirty side of it, you know. <laughs> People are such babies. People oh, are yeah. such babies. Well, thank you so much, Mindy. You guys, thank what a great night. Everybody was so funny this evening. I got to thank all the guests again. Frank Nicotero. Thank you so much, Frank, wherever you are. Let's clap for Frank. And also Esther Koo. Let me see you. Where's Esther? Esther, that was a great story. And uh, also, of course, uh, Mindy, amazing story. Thank you so much. And Jacob Rosales, as always, fantastic. Listen to StoryWorthy this week, you guys. This week on StoryWorthy, I have a really interesting guy. His name is Nikki Hendrickson, and he's not a comedian, which is very odd for me because usually I just have comics. But this guy, Nikki Hendrickson, he invented a company called Carlipso. And then he sold Carlipso 
to Carvana. Carvana is the largest in, uh, the largest auto dealership, not dealership, but it's the largest online car dealership. Anyway, the point is he's super interesting. And Nikki talks all about cars. So tune in tomorrow for that, you guys, on Storyworthy. And right now, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Blank Patch, and he'll introduce the game and tell you how we're going to play it. Please stick around. If you want to play the game, just raise your hand, and I'll promote you to panelists, as it were. And Mindy, stick around. Esther, you guys are going to be uh, judging alongside with Blaine. And so I'm going to take myself my two-minute break, and I will be right back. And so once again, you guys, thank you so much. Good night. I place my own bets, and I make my own deals. So if you follow. Thanks for joining us on the